first I have a question. How many of you are familiar with the Mercury program? Okay, so I go quite fast on the first slides. So <laughs> just to introduce the um, uh, program. So many uh, ministry of Capitary actions are fellowships uh, um, that are intended to support research and mobility across Europe. Uh, they are active since 1996. Uh, they are, are intended to foster career development of young researchers especially, but they are not only for young researchers. And uh, um, they are um, intended to support interdisciplinary research uh, and international collaborations. There are different programs uh, in the Mercury Actions uh, uh, that one could apply for uh, based on whether you want to spend time uh, abroad uh, in Europe or outside Europe, whether you have some uh, career breaks uh, due to pregnancy or illness, for example, um, or whether you want you you are a European national but you spend time um, outside Europe and you want to come back. Just to give you an idea, this is the um, uh, call I applied for, it was last year, 2018, and there were about 10,000 applications. That's because the Mercury Fellowship, the Mercury program in general, especially the individual fellowships, so those intended for researchers to move around in Europe, are uh, quite a prestigious and competitive uh, kind of scheme. So you can see about 10,000 proposals, a bit more than 1,000 proposals uh, accepted and funded, so it's a bit more than one out of 10. This is just to give you an idea. Um, this, uh, of course, um, everyone can apply in the specific scheme uh, you are working on, so if you if your research is focused on chemistry, as most of us are, um, um, then you would apply for the chemistry scheme, but of course if you do something that is more of the interface with biology, you might think about applying for that um, um, section as well, uh, or engineering as well. Uh, as you can see here, basically if you, are, if you don't, so your proposal will, will get a score um, uh, up to 100, if you get scored below 70, you're not included in this table. Um, if you look at the, um, let's say, the basic scheme, that is to spend, uh, to use the fellowship to stay in Europe, uh, in another country with respect to where you were, and this is for chemistry, so this is the uh, standard individual fellowship, the threshold is 92.8, so if you score below 92.8, you wouldn't get the fellowship. That doesn't mean at all that your project wasn't good enough, wasn't good. Most of the times, it's really based on luck. Um, if most of you know, more or less, uh, are familiar with Mercury Fellowships, you said, but uh, just to give you an idea, the proposals is um, organized in 10 pages, and they need to be 10 pages. Uh, and it's organized in three different parts. There's the excellence part, uh, there's the impact and the implementation. Most of the, of the proposal will be focused on you, on your research idea, on the research project, the way you want to develop um, the research project and manage that. Um, but also there is a part where you need to explain why you decided to go in a specific group, so why the supervisor is the right one, and why the host institution is the right one. And at the same time, as we discussed earlier this morning and in the past days, um, it's also important not only the research that you want to do, but also how you want to communicate the research you are going to do. So this is a very boring slide, so sorry for that, but I just want to share with you how the proposal is organized. So as I was saying, there is a first part of this excellence where you have the research project. So you can see that you have the state of the art, you have to describe which are the objectives, uh, the overview, exactly which kind of experiments uh, you want to, um, to do, and so on. But there is also something else in the excellence part. The excellence part out of, three, of the three parts scores 50% of the total score. So you can see that in the excellence part, there's not only your research project. So your research project is not worth 50% of the score, it's less than that. 
that's what we call the political blah blah of the Medicare proposals. Mm -hmm. uh, that is quite important for this kind of application. So in the accidents, there's the research part, but also you need to explain what you are bringing to the group and what the group is, giving, is going to give you back. You need to say why the supervisor is the right one and why the institution is the right one. And then you need to explain during the two, the two or the three years of fellowship, uh, because if you stay in Europe, it's two years. If you go abroad, um, like for example, in the US, Canada, China, India, Australia, wherever, then it's going to be three years to spend abroad and then one back in Europe. You need to explain in those two years or three years uh, what you're, how you are going to um, enhance your um, and reinforce your independence. And then at the beginning of the impact, there's another session section that is close, that is um, quite related in terms of topic, which is how you're going to. Uh, expand and, and uh, reinforce your independence after the end of the fellowship. And of course, as the name says in the impact section that co scores 30% of the, the final score, you have to explain how you're going to disseminate and how you're going to communicate your research. So not only scientific, uh, scientific journals and conferences, but also um, outreach activities, uh, um, going around the schools, participating to your the European researchers' night, and so on. And then there's the last part, that is the implementation part, in which you have to explain that not only you have thought about the project, but also you know exactly what you are going to do from day one. So they want to be sure that you know everyone that is working in that institute and who is going to support you for finding a, from finding a flat around or close by the institution, to who is going to take care of uh, uh, placing your orders. And that's where uh, the uh, last two um, parts of the last two section paragraphs of the implementation, uh, that's what the last two paragraphs of the implementation are about. So uh, the appropriateness of the management structure, also in terms of uh, how many meetings you're going to have with your PI uh, and other internal meetings, uh, and which what happens if something goes wrong. So if you have an idea, if you have your project, and you think, okay, this is going to work, what if it doesn't? You need to have, or ready plan B, C, D. And then, of course, the support from the institutional, envi this, the institutional environment. So when I looked at this, I realized that there were some of these paragraphs that I thought overlapped quite a lot. And so when you write this, it's not enough to write something for all of these paragraphs. You also need to be sure that you are not writing the same information in more than one part. Um, so, for example, as I was saying before, there are two paragraphs in which you have to explain on one side what's the uh, contribute that the fellowship will give you during the two years and what's the contribution after the end of the fellowship. You have these two paragraphs in which you have to distinguish what dissemination means and communication means. And then you have these other two paragraphs in which you have to distinguish uh, the kind of support the institute, the institute will give you in terms of uh, creating an open environment where you can discuss with people, divisional meetings, departmental seminars, uh, and also, but on the other side, the second uh, section in the implementation part is more related to which kind of offices will be there to support you, which <coughs> kind of instruments are available. I give you, I, I now move towards something that is hopefully a bit more interesting, and that's my story, or at least it's interesting for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, just to give you a bit of context of um, my career path, uh, I am Italian, and I was born in Siena, and that's where I've done my uh, bachelor degree. And for my bachelor degree, I uh, did a project on protein crystallography. And it was metalloproteins crystallography, so that's when I started being interested in bioinorganic chemistry. But then I decided that I wanted to do something a bit more in the lab rather than looking at structures. And so what I did uh, was moving in at the University of Padova, which is a bit northern, close to Venice, still in Italy, where I did um, anti-cancer drugs based on metal peptide complexes. So you see bioinorganic chemistry is still there, a uh, different approach. And then for my PhD, I had two options. One was uh, doing exactly the same thing, so still anti-cancer drugs, and it would have been in Germany. The other option uh, was uh, about using my knowledge about metal peptide complexes 
and exploited that to understand how metalloproteins emerged on the early Earth. And you already know it was my choice. So I moved to the University of Trento, which is a very small city close to the Alps, where I did study uh, the origin and the activity of uh, a model of metalloproteins. And during my PhD, I, did, uh, I had uh, the possibility to spend some time abroad. So as you can see, so far I was only in Italy. During my PhD, I had the opportunity to spend four months at the uh, MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge uh, to study photochemistry, and then four months in Harvard University uh, in Boston to study um, lipids and membranes, still from an origin of life point of view. And then, at the end of my PhD, I moved back to Cambridge, UK, where I was before, but I kept, doing, uh, I kept working with lipids and membranes from an um, origin of life point of view. So, just to give you an idea of what was on my CV when I applied for the Mercury Fellowship, uh, I didn't have that many publications. Um, I had seven, uh, but only three um, as first authors as first author, um, but as you can see, I had a lot of other things, uh, mainly because I'm not able to do only one thing, and I can't say no to it, so I tend to do a lot of things in general, um, and that apparently uh, had quite a lot, so I did receive some awards, uh, both at the national uh, and international level, uh, I participated to international conferences, I won travel grants, I did some teaching experience and outreach experiences, and also I was part of scientific associations, uh, both from uh, just uh, as a member or as a volunteer. Why did I decide to apply for a Mercury Fellowship? The main reason was because it was going to give me independence, uh, independence in going on with my research, deciding the project and managing that. But also, of course, there is the prestige that comes from the UK fellowships, because they are quite well known uh, all over Europe, at least. Uh, the opportunity to create a network of scientists, not only in my research field, but also among other, with other military fellows. Uh, the uh, possibility of expanding my expertise and strengthening my expertise, but also learning new skills. Of course, doing everything in a European context was important, so I was going outside the local country where I was. And last but not least, uh, money, mm -hmm. because the salary is quite high. <laughs> so, um, when did I decide to apply? Uh, so, a common question that I normally get when I say that I get that I got a fel the Mercury Fellowship is how long does it take to write the project? So, uh, I did publish my last PhD paper um, as a first as first author at the beginning of June, and that's when I decided to apply. The deadline was at the beginning of September, so it was three months before that, and I didn't have an idea at all. So what I, what was, my, my, the luck was that um, in June, normally you can find a lot of seminars and webinars about how to apply on, uh, to Mary Curie Fellowship, and that's because it's more, more or less normal in that um, month. And so, because I was already in Cambridge, there were quite a lot of, um, activities organized by the research office of the university and of my institute. So I did, attend to the, I did attend them, but also there were activities organized by the Italian Chemical Society and other societies, so I could also follow webinars uh, and uh, um, find slides online on how to apply to this fellowship. So I had more or less an idea around the middle of June on how to apply to this fellowship. And then I started thinking about an idea, I discussed it with my supervisor, and something that helped me quite a lot uh, was um, I started to contact everyone I could find that got a fellowship, a military fellowship. I think I contacted about 10 uh, fellows uh, and a couple of evaluators. Um, they were all super nice, so they shared with me the um, their, their uh, awarded application, and so I had also something to read that could help me in understanding what was really needed in the application and what wasn't, um, and where I could, uh, I was free to write what I wanted. I did use uh, the month of July to write the application because something that was very important was sharing it with others so that I could get the feedback. So at the beginning of 
August I shared it with um, friends, not only in my field, um, but also in my field, so that I could get uh, feedback also on, not only on the scientific part, but also on uh, the rest of the proposal. Um, of course, uh, uh, depending on the institution you choose, that you might have internal deadlines, uh, or you might need to uh, fill <coughs> paperwork so, so you, or get approval. So uh, just check that with your um, institution. So that was mainly um, the last month. And then I did submit the proposal one week in advance. Uh, even though the online application would have allowed me to change the application before the deadline, even the day, uh, even after my submission. So I did decide to submit it in advance, and then if there was anything I wanted to change, I could have. So I'm not going to be specific on what I'm doing and what my project is, but I think it's relevant for what I was saying before. So what you are going to be asked uh, at the beginning of when you apply for the fellowship is to find a title and an acronym. They need to be catchy, they need to be self-explanatory, and they need to be interesting. Um, in my case, the, um, the acronym was RNA Rep, and I thought it was quite nice, and also it sounds nice, so that uh, it would have been easier for evaluators that normally get like 10 or 20 proposals at the same time and they have to evaluate them for like in like one week. Uh, I thought it was um, a kind of sound that they could have remembered. And then the title is Repeating Cycles of Chemically Driven RNA Replication with Modded Protocells. And I'm not going to explain that, but what I want to show you is that the, my expertise and the, the two-way transfer that is very important for Mercury Fellowship is already in the title. My expertise, apart from bioinorganic chemistry, was um, um, membranes and lipids. So the blue part of the title, Modern Protocells, was my expertise. Chemically driven RNA replication was the expertise of the lab. I've never done that, but they are quite strong on that. Repeating cycles is what we could develop together, merging the two expertises. So um, the two-way transfer is fundamental, and uh, it's one of the most important parts of the uh, application. At the end of the application, in the, in the implementation part, you need to um, as I was saying, you need to show that not only you have an idea, but you need to um, show that you know exactly when you are going to do what. And so the, you, are, you, are norm, you are asked to upload, a, to, to have a, to add a table that uh, is this gun chart. Uh, you are quite free in terms of format, but these are the kind of information that you need to put. And apart from the first three lines, which are about the objective, so when I'm going to finish the first part of the project, what I'm going to do with that, I'm going to um, publish a paper, or I'm going to write a technical report about a specific instrument I've learned to use. But also you can see here that RM means risk management, so every once in a while I was going to have a meeting, I am planning to have a meeting with my PI if something doesn't work so that I can think about what to do if, um, uh, as an alternative. I have put dissemination and scientific meeting and public engagement activities because that's what they want. And because you are going to write, I mean, not because that's what they want and I don't care, in the sense that they, they want you to show that you are going to disseminate and communicate your, your research and they want you to show it also in the um, GAN chart. And then the last line is quite important. It's about career development. Not only you need to show that you're going to do science and you're going to disseminate and communicate that, you also need to show that that's going to be important for you. So for example, here I, sh I wrote, I um, filled the table saying that at the beginning I was going to have a meeting with my PI, deciding what was the career path that I would like to um, take and um, how to achieve the different goals and so on. And then at the end, you can see I've planned to use uh, the last months of the fellowship to think about uh, possible grants or to apply for if I want to become a PI and so on. So what do you need to, um, what do you need to get the fellowship? I don't know.
<laughs> in the sense that uh, there's not only one way. So this is my way, this is what worked for me. This doesn't mean that it's going to work always, but that's what worked for me. Um, you need the perfect combination. Uh, you, your supervisor, and your institute. So for me, I was bringing, I, was, I had a specific ex expertise. My supervisor had a specific expertise. The institute was exactly the right place to merge the two expertise. You need a project that is challenging and innovative. Uh, of course, it's not an ERC project, so you don't have to plan five years research uh, that doesn't include only you, involve only you, but also other people. It's, a, it's your project, so they don't expect something that is groundbreaking in, the, in terms of I'm going to solve this world problem but they want something that is challenging and innovative and it should be connected to the EU context. So for example, in my case, because I was studying origin of life, and you would think that no one cares about that, but because the EU, especially the uh, European Space Agency, is spending quite a lot of money um, to support projects about exoplanets, for example, or on the other side, origin of life could be related to artificial cells and artificial life, then my con and there are quite a lot of networks uh, active in Europe about that, then my project, uh, as soon as I connected my project to those two things, was clear which was the European context in which my project was going to be. For me, it was very useful to have awarded proposals and evaluation files. Uh, you don't have to hand people to share with you the proposals, but for me it was very, very useful especially because you can easily understand whether there is something that if someone, if you have eight proposals and everyone has written something, that means that that should be in the proposal. So um, I was discussing before about the fact that I wrote in my proposal that um, I was going to act as an AQE ambassador and sharing my experience as an AQE fellow. That's something that I found basically in all the proposals I read, so I thought maybe I should write it as well. So that's something you might want to do as well. Um, you need colleagues and friends as reviewers, uh, you need feedback. Uh, definitely, you, you, it's not going to work if you don't share your science with anyone. That's not going to work at all. And of course you should um, uh, exploit the research funding offices and the uh, national contact points. Last slide, <coughs> again, quite a uh, full slide, sorry about that, but these are all the advice that I got from emails and friends and uh, uh, that I contacted about my application. So the, research, the proposal is not only about research. As I was saying, the research project goes in the first part, that is core 50%, and it's not even only that. So you need something else apart from the idea. The, so the proposal should describe your you, should describe what you want to become, what you want to do, and what you want to learn. You have 10 pages, and you really have 10 pages, which means that when you upload your, your proposal, if it's longer than 10 pages, everything that is in the 11th page is going to be cut. So you really want to fit everything in 10 pages, but there are quite a lot of restrictions in terms of format, so check that. You need to keep everything consistent and clear. Federico said that as well about scientific papers. It's the same for proposals. Uh, if you use uh, a specific acronym, you use always the same. Do not use a specialized language. Um, of course, there, the, um, there will be, um, the European Commission will try to match your proposal with experts in your field, but that won't happen always. You are the main expert in that specific research idea, on that specific research project. So it's very unlikely that you will find someone that understands exactly what you, what you are trying to explain. So try to make it as um, comprehensible as possible. But at the same time, you need to show that you know exactly what you want to do. So if you want to do an experiment, write down that that experiment is how you are going to do that experiment, to which kind of techniques you are going to use. I said it already, and uh, it's not probably enough. Um, everything, all, all the parts of all the components of the sections of, that, of the proposals are fundamental. It's not only research. 
do not hesitate to contact the national contact point. I email them, I don't know how many times, they must hate me. Um, it would be nice if you can write the proposal with your supervisor. This doesn't always happen. It was, it was easy for me because I was already in the lab. Uh, sometimes it doesn't happen because you plan to go somewhere and you are only going to, you are only going to be there whether if you, apply, if you receive the fellowship. But if you have some kind of, if you can have some kind of support from the uh, research office or the supervisor, that would be ideal. Again, you need someone that um, um, read your proposal, and uh, you need someone that check uh, the spelling and that can proofread the English, because it's got it. Evaluators told me that it's annoying when it's not spelled in the right way. Um, that's something I've already said. So if you have a format, follow that. Um, you can use bold. Uh, text you can use underline so make make it easy for the evaluators to read your proposals do not overuse take graphs and tables so you can definitely use um, images to explain what you want to do uh, but do not overuse them and make it uh, less readable the as if that's something that Federico said as well but the beginning of the proposal is very important because it's going to catch the attention of the, um, of the evaluators. The end of the project or the proposal is, going to, is very important because it's the conclusion of your whole proposal. So those are the most important part of the proposal. You are not writing it because you are not writing a technical report, but you are telling a story, so you need to sell the story. If you don't get it, you are not a failure. That happens. That's the reason why you can use the same the same project for multiple applications. That's what I've done as well. Um, and if you don't get it, it's mostly because you haven't been lucky on that occasion. So you can keep trying and trying and trying. Because if you don't try, you'll never get it. You can find me on Twitter or you can email me if you want. So if you need any kind of uh, advice, uh, don't hesitate to contact me. Also, I'm around in these days uh, and I have my uh, proposal always with me in case you are curious about how it should be written.